some other concepts around change management. So I mentioned earlier, um, you want to have a common language among IT, um, so people know what are the difference, for example, between um, what's the difference between a normal and a standard change. Um, I can't say I'm a fan of the words that the idle authors chose because I think it's a little bit confusing, but there are real differences between normal and standard changes. Um, the way we usually differentiate is that a normal change follows the normal change process and normal changes are presented to the change advisory board, whereas standard changes are pre-authorized and do not go before the change advisory board. An example of a standard change might be something like a new user setup request or a new laptop request, um, something that's very low risk, it's an established procedure, and um, it can often be fulfilled using the service request process, and we'll talk about a little about it in a little bit. But um, essentially, the um, the standard changes will be approved at either the service desk or a manager level, as opposed to the full change advisory board level. Emergency changes are much like normal changes, except that the time frames are compressed. So at, just like it sounds, uh, an emergency change is a change that is requested to resolve a particular incident or other type of outage or to prevent an outage within the organization. Um, the time frames, usually we're talking in a matter of hours or days, so it can't wait for perhaps the weekly change advisory board meeting. And there is a change advisory board that provides the approval. It's usually the ECAB or the Emergency Change Advisory Board. And membership to the ECAB does vary just based on the particular uh, categorization or the product related to the specific emergency change request. Some other key concepts when we're talking about change management. Um, I've mentioned the change advisory board. So there's a group um, which is chaired by the change manager um, that meets on often a weekly basis to review changes for approval. And I'll show you a full um, recommended agenda for the CAB here in just a moment. Some of the other things that we uh, require often for change management are back out or remediation plans. So when we are um, submitting change requests, there is an expectation that that will contain not just the justification and the um, particular CIs or services that are being requested, but it should also include a back out plan. Um, we should have a schedule for the change, so we want to know when that change is proposed. Um, and we should keep that schedule so that we have this projected schedule of outages. So we may have um, a blackout window, for example, during periods of high utilization within IT. So um, during our last session, we talked about uh, patterns of business activity. It's important to understand that if we are a retail operation, for example, that we not make changes during the busy Christmas season. Or if we are a university, then we don't make changes to our IT infrastructure during um, the fall enrollment and uh, onboarding or, or um, start of school period. There's also um, a little bit different than our projected outages is the forward schedule of changes. So we want to also try to minimize the impact to the organization by not loading up a lot of changes within a specific period of time. And we also want to understand, um, again, this is where configuration management is, comes into play and is so important. It helps us to identify, um, for example, if I'm going to upgrade a particular database, um, if it's on a specific system, I don't want to be patching that system at the same time. I mentioned the, uh, the cab and being able to set up uh, a meeting agenda, these are some of the things that could be or should be 
covered during a CAB meeting. We want to review problematic changes, so sometimes called a postmortem. Uh, we want to look at changes that may have failed or that may have had to um, may have been backed out or unauthorized changes. So if we have a discovery tool, it may help us to identify changes to a particular server or other um, component within the infrastructure where there's been a change that does not have a corresponding change request or approved change request. Obviously, we want to be reviewing requests for change. And if there are any notices of requests that are expected to be coming to the Change Advisory Board, especially if they're large, um, something that I often refer back to is in the idle service transition book, it does refer to, uh, there is an example, um, it's figure 4.5 if you have access to that, to that particular book. Um, it's an example of a change authorization model. Although the Change Advisory Board should make most of the decisions um, for IT changes, there is this expectation that with higher levels of complexity and higher levels of risk to the organization, um, there should be higher levels of change authorization. So there are some changes that may need to be escalated even as high as the Business Executive Board. Something else interesting here, the change management process itself should be reviewed. And as a process, um, just like with documentation and some of these other intangible um, types of assets that we have within the organization, the change management process itself should be regularly reviewed. And there may be requests for change to the change process itself if it's for some reason cumbersome or perhaps not adequately, adequately addressing the risk to the organization. There are several phases to the change process. So we have the initial in initiation when we have the, re the uh, request for change submitted. I mentioned that you should open up the process to the end users and customers, but also there may be people within IT submitting requests for change or even vendors. So vendors may, may, may provide notification of new versions, point releases, hot fixes that may then result in requests for change. There should be a period of risk and impact analysis and assessment. That often comes from the technical specialist, subject matter experts, and that information then gets forwarded on to the Change Advisory Board, who in turn um, provides a recommendation for approval or rejection of the change. The change manager would log the approval if it is approved, um, which then leads to the implementation of the change and ultimately the review. Now, the implementation arm of the change management process is typically handed over to the release management process. So there is sometimes a, um, some confusion about, well, when does change get handed off to release? And it's usually during this implementation phase. In release and deployment management, the goal here is to um, create the release and deployment plans. Testing is a big part of release management. And um, as we move through the release process, um, making sure that we have the de delivery capability, um, deciding what the delivery model is going to be. Are we going to do this as a big bang or a phased approach, for example? Is there going to be a pilot? Uh, we want to ensure minimal impact to the organization. So we plan releases for off hours or periods of low activity. And then ultimately, we want to verify satisfaction with the release. I would say that may be one of the more overlooked activities within release and deployment management. Um, but it is really hand in hand with the testing. So the verifying satisfaction often includes training for the new service that's being released. Um, so testing and training are both important 
components of release management. In talking about training, um, knowledge management is an important component of training for the organization. So I'm going to bring up the components of knowledge management here. For knowledge management, we have four components and they build on each other. Um, with increased context and understanding, um, we go from having data initially, putting that data together, um, we develop information. Ultimately, that leads to knowledge about the particular um, service that we're providing, and then ultimately wisdom, which is kind of a lofty goal for IT. But really, um, knowledge management does seek to make sense of all of the components that we're supporting within IT. Um, I mentioned that knowledge management in particular spans several phases of the service life cycle. And we can start to gather knowledge about a particular service um, really as soon as we start with the design of that service. So it's sometimes an afterthought. It's usually a fairly easy construct. Um, some of the things I would recommend for knowledge management, and if you are building a knowledge base for the organization, um, an important thing is to have a system that will either remind you or at least have some mechanism for review. So um, when you have a knowledge base, knowledge can be outdated very quickly. Um, applications uh, change quickly, so and services are, are upgraded often. So we want to usually on an annually, annual basis be reviewing the knowledge. So when you create a new knowledge article, for example, um, it's helpful if the system you're using has a way to set a review date so that you can be reminded at a later time to review and update as needed um, the individual knowledge articles. It's helpful also if you can share this knowledge beyond IT. So um, there may be some instructions that are uh, to a technical degree of complexity where you may not want the end users um, attempting some of those fixes on their own. But really, for those end users who are comfortable with that technology and who are going to go and search the knowledge base, um, it is can be very helpful to have that knowledge accessible to them. So really, as early on in the process as you can, um, it's important to be able to capture the knowledge that's being generated either by the developers or by the designers of the service and, uh, and put that into the knowledge base for future reference. So those are the processes of service transition that I wanted to review with you all today. Um, there are some other concepts that I wanted to to uh, to reference here, and I will also be reviewing some of the KPIs or key performance indicators that are specific to the service transition phase of the life cycle. As an output of the service transition phase of the life cycle, we have a service release package that's basically our um, the new, new or changed service that's being deployed into production, and that gets supported by service operations. 